Praise the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, right? It is great to see all of you here today. Another joy to be able to gather to remember um, that Jesus Christ came into the world. And that on this day we remember that Jesus began those first steps into gifting us the fullness of salvation. So today is a day that we celebrate, and it's also a day where we begin a week of remembering. Lent we've been talking about as a hard and holy work, and today is part of that hard work as we remember on one breath that we proclaim Hosanna, holy and blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But we know that even our own lives will proclaim by the end of this week, crucify him, as we prepare for the days that are yet to come. As we move through our worship service today, if you didn't pick up a palm branch on your way in, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, if you want one and you don't have one, Jim can make sure that you get one. But at any time during the service, we're going to do a very unwhite Protestant thing that if you feel that the Spirit has moved you, you can wave that branch high in the air and you can even accompany it with an amen. Um, if you want to, as we worship today. As we move through this week, Thursday is Monday Thursday, and we will have a special um, service at Peace UCC at 6.30 p.m. That's um, an intimate service where we spend some time with the scriptures where Jesus says to love one another and to care for one another. We remember what it means like in this 21st century world to be able to serve and to wash hands and feet and souls and hearts and cleanse them for the work of Christ. And then on Friday, we will gather as a community at 1230 right across the street at St. James Episcopal Church for a community service where we will go through the stations of the cross and to hear these, the words of Jesus' crucifixion read. If you've never experienced that and you are able to, you're, if your work allows you to be present during that time, please come and join us. And then on Easter morning, we begin that day at 6 a.m. with our traditional uh, Easter sunrise service. Um, it's, we always have called it Blue Rail Beach, but recently has been renamed Lighthouse Park Beach, um, right between um, the Yacht Club and the Marina. Um, there's a little beach there, and as of today, the weather forecast is pretty good um, for Easter morning. So um, we're just going to plan on that being the same there. So if you're unable to join us there, you will be able to tune in on WOMT Radio. Um, wherever, wherever they broadcast, which should be most of our areas, I, I assume, um, we can, we can, you can hear that as well. And then we have a breakfast at 8.30. It's a special breakfast this year, a little bit different. We're having breakfast with the warming shelter. Um, our guests will, will, um, will be our guests. They'll join us. We'll be right downstairs, and uh, we'll be in the midst of the shelter. We'll move a few things. We'll set up the tables. We are preparing um, an egg casserole, and many of you have already begun to sign up. Um, Jim, there's that clipboard for the breakfast in the back there. Why don't you um, just get that started in case you haven't signed up. There's two things. You may come, and we want to know how many people are coming. And if you're able to bring something, then you can also put that down um, on there so we know, so everybody can kind of see what type of potluck food is being brought. And this is crucially important that the food you bring, this is a to-eat breakfast potluck, right? So we assume that it will be ready to eat um, when you bring it. So don't bring us a pound of frozen bacon. Um, 
because, well, some of us might eat it raw, but that's another story, right? We don't want to take the time to prepare it. We want to bring that in. If it's some things that you want to bring that um, um, don't need to be cooked or something, if you're bringing in fresh fruit and it's easier for you to bring some of that in earlier during the week, you're welcome to bring that stuff into the office um, earlier in the week. And we will have some, there might even be some Easter eggs that need to be found. Um, so if some young people are here, there may be some lost Easter eggs that need finding. Um, and then we will move to, um, to worship right up here at 10 a.m. So it's a wonderful and busy week coming forward. And I hope that each and every one of you is able to adjust your life a little bit um, to be able to make that happen. So let us continue our worship today. Steve? Please stand, if you are able, as we call ourselves to worship. The end of our hard and holy journey is near. We see the towers of justice. We hear the cries of the people. We are still wading in the water, still feasting on manna. But the parade has begun. We rejoice and shout Hosanna. Yet we also see the shadow of the cross. We are overwhelmed Take heart, God is still in charge. Let us listen, let us wait, let us act. God is still here, even when the pharaohs of the world are strong. Let us worship the Lord. Please be seated. So, all the young people would like to come forward now. We have a special thing today. Mix Brittany and I have decided that we want to show you a, um, a special movie. Okay, so if you want to sit, you can sit on the floor or you can sit up there. Um, and Pete, let me see that book just for a minute. So this is a of a book called What? It is by um, a friend of Meredith and I, um, David Lamont, um, who is a singer from the Appalachia area. Um, and also done a lot of work and things. And he wrote this book a couple years back. And it's about another parade, another parade that takes place. Um, and let's just watch it a little bit. And it's going to feed not only for our children, but also for all of us to remind us a little bit about a special lesson. So, Lori, let's go ahead and just... The day was bright and sunny as most May Days tend to be in the hills of Appalachia, down in Knoxville, Tennessee. A dozen men put on their suits and quickly took their places in white robes and those tall and pointed hoods that hid their faces. Their feet fell down in rhythm as they started their parade. They raised their fists into the air. They bellowed and they brayed. They loved to stir the people up. They loved when they were taunted. They didn't mind the anger. It's exactly what they wanted. And as they came around the corner, sure enough, the people roared. But they couldn't quite believe their ears. It seemed to be support. Had Knoxville finally seen the light, were people coming round, the men thought for a moment that they'd found their kind of town. But then they turned their eyes to where the cheering had its source. As one their shoulders crumpled when they saw the mighty force, the crowd had painted faces, and some had tacky clothes, their hair and hats outrageous, each had a bright red nose. The clowns had come in numbers to enjoy the grand parade, and they laughed and danced that other clowns had come to town that day. And then the marchers shouted, and the clowns all strained to hear, each one tuned in intently with a hand cupped to an ear. White power, screamed the marchers, and they raised their fisted hands. 
The clowns leaned in and listened, like they couldn't understand, and then one held up his finger and helped all the others see the point of all this yelling, and they joined right in with glee. White flower, the clowns shouted, and they reached inside their clothes. They pulled out bags and tore them, and huge clouds of powder rose. They poured it on each other, and they threw it in the air. It got all over baggy clothes and multicolored hair. Now all but just a few of them were joining in the jokes. You could almost see the marchers turning red beneath white cloaks. They wanted to look scary. They wanted to look tough. One rushed right at the clowns in rage and was hauled away in cuffs. But the others chanted louder, marching on around the bend. The clowns all marched on too, of course, supporting their new friends. White power, came the marcher's cry. They were not amused. The clowns grew still and thoughtful. Well, perhaps they'd been confused. They huddled and consulted this bright and silly crowd. They listened quite intently. Then one said, I've got it now. White flowers, screamed the happy clown, and all the rest joined in. The air was filled with flowers, and they laughed and danced again. Everyone loves flowers, and white's a pretty sort. I can't think of a better cause for people to support. Green flower stems went flying, like small arrows from bad archers, and white petals covered everything, including the mad marchers. And then a very tall clown called the others to attention. He choked down all his chuckles and said, Friends, I have to mention that what with all this mirth and fun, it's sort of hard to hear, but now I know the cause that these paraders hold so dear. Tight showers, the clown blurted, as he hit his head in wonder. He held up a camp shower, and the others all got under. Or at least they tried to get beneath. They strained, but couldn't quite. There wasn't room for all of them. They pushed, but it was tight. White power, came the mad refrain, quite carefully pronounced. The clowns consulted once again. Then a woman clown announced, I've got it. I'm embarrassed that it took so long to see, but what these marchers march for is a cause quite dear to me. Wife power, she exclaimed, and all the other clowns joined in. They shook their heads and laughed at how erroneous they'd been. The women clowns were hoisted up on shoulders of the others. Some pulled on wedding dresses, chanting, Here's to wives and mothers! The men in robes were sullen. They knew they'd been defeated. They yelled a few more times, and then they finally retreated. And when they'd gone, a kind policeman turned to all the clowns and offered them an escort through the center of the town. The day was bright and sunny, as most May days tend to be, in the hills of Appalachia, down in Knoxville, Tennessee. People joined the new parade. The crowd stretched out for miles. The clowns passed out more flowers and made everybody smile. And what would be the lesson of that shiny southern day? Can we understand the message that the clowns sought to convey? Seems that when you're fighting hatred, hatred's not the thing to use. So here's to those who march on in their big red floppy shoes. Fired by true events on May 26, 2000. eat it but you other people might like it <laughs> I'm sure it's yummy it's just not one of my favorite okay so maybe clowns aren't your most favorite thing but do you know what they were doing they were trying to make people laugh instead of people try being mad because the other people there and those whole white suits and covered their face they wanted people to hate each other and the clowns said, no, we want people to laugh and to like each other. So today we celebrate a parade. So Jesus had a parade into the city of Jerusalem. And do you think Jesus wanted people to hate each other or to laugh and to be happy and care about each other? That's right. That's the parade that Jesus wanted. But you know what? The, Jerusalem is a big city. 
And there was room to come in way over here where Jesus was, and all the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means, happy are we, blessed are you, Lord. But then on the other side of town, there was a more grumpy parade. And it was the military power was coming into town, and they were saying, you better not get out of hand this week during your celebrations, or else we're going to make sure you stay in line. And people had to choose then. We have to choose today. So I'm glad that you're choosing a happy parade. Okay? Can we pray together? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for making a happy parade for us. Help us to go and smile and bring joy to people we meet. Amen. Okay. Now, Please be in a spirit of prayer with me. Holy God, reveal your presence to us this day as we journey down the path of hard and holy work. Illumine us and challenge us. Amen. I invite us to hear the word of the Lord in this hard and holy time of the Israelites during the Exodus as we read together from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community broke camp and set out from the Sin Desert to continue their journey as the Lord commanded. They set up their camp at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? our children, and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? They are getting ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of Israel's elders with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you use to strike the Nile River and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Hit the rock. Water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites argued with and tested the Lord, asking, Is the Lord really with us or not? The word of the Lord. Let us be challenged and comforted. Amen. Amen. Lori, why don't you advance it? My thing doesn't want to click her. There we go. So we can read this story from Exodus in a lot of different ways. That's the fun thing about Scripture is that we often bring our own perspectives to it. 
Often the eyes that we choose to read Scripture through can color what we say and think about it. And so today I want us to hear this Scripture in the same context that we've been talking throughout Lent about hard and holy work. So today then, in that context, we have a story of adversity, of hard work that the Israelites were trying to do. They were trying to figure out, what do we do in the face of adversity? What is that next big thing? It seems that the poor Israelites, their world just kept falling apart around them all the time. As they made their way through the wilderness, nothing seemed to go easy for them. You remember, I mean, first they were in slavery. And they cried out again and again, and God heard their cry. And God rescued them, and that seemed great. And they went out into the wilderness, and then they were lost. And God said, well, come back and go over here, oh, and by the way, Pharaoh's army is also coming, and it seems as if God had placed them between that literal rock and a hard place, between the Red Sea and an army, and they prayed, and God parted the waters. And then they went out, and they were free again, but then they began to get hungry. And again, they began to say, what did you do, God? Did you bring us out here just so we could starve? And then God brought quail and God brought manna for them. God answered them again in some special and miraculous way. And now what's the next thing they're supposed to do? Well, they keep knowing that there's this land flowing of milk and honey, some promised land they're supposed to get to. And now they've been in the desert, we don't know quite how long, but they're thirsty. Now the average temperature out there in the Sinai Desert between May and August is about 100 degrees. Now I grew up in Phoenix where, you know, it's a, it's a dry heat. Um, but 100 degrees gets warm, you know, we don't go out without our water bottles. Back in the day when we were younger, it was, oh, well, you should carry some salt tablets with you because if you start to get drowsy, your body needs salt. And we'd have these little aspirin-sized pills of just concentrated salt that we could put under our tongue. But here they were. They didn't have anything like that. They didn't quite know where they were going. And there they were, stuck in the middle of the desert. And whether it had been one day or two days or three days with no water, you know, the average human person can deal maybe a hundred hours without water, and that's in good conditions. And here they were, in the middle of the desert with no water. It wasn't a minor complaint. They weren't just saying, oh, I just wish I had a more comfortable pair of sandals. No, their complaint was about life and death. What are you going to do with us, God? Did you bring us out here in the middle of the desert just so we could die of thirst? Is this some perverse pleasure you get in seeing us tortured all the time? They began to wonder. Is God really among them or not? Had they misinterpreted, had they misheard, had they put their trust in Moses? And maybe they shouldn't have. Now I will tell you, friends, this is a place where we can join with the thoughts of the Israelites. How many of us have wondered sometimes, is God really among us? 
Maybe we've cried out, are you here, God? Because our world seems to be falling apart and you don't seem to do anything. Are you here, God? Because I'm struggling with illness or addiction or fear and you don't seem to do anything. Are you here, God? Because the system is stacked against us. Are you here, God? It's cold living on the streets. Are you here, God? I haven't heard a good meal in a week. Are you here, God? Because a hate group has used a platform to dismerge this very community at a school board meeting. Are you here, God, because I can't pay my bills? Are you here, God, because my family isn't talking to one another? Are you here, God, because I just can't go on living like this anymore? Are you here, God, because injustice is still happening? We are tired. God, we are hungry, God, we are thirsty, God, are you here? Yeah, we can understand what those Israelites were going through. We can understand it. When we cry out just like the Israelites, it's because we don't know what's coming next. And the evidence around us seems to suggest that what is coming next is not going to be good. We look all around us. We look at the people who have gone before us. We look at all the seeds of justice that have been implanted and we still see injustice all around. God, are you here? Are you listening? Tell us, God, what is the next thing we're supposed to do? God, are you here? We don't know what to do next. Sometimes people wish the preacher could stand up here and tell you that, okay, if we do A, B, and C... We're going to have to build a new building because there's going to be too many people in our pews. If we do this, everyone will be happy. If we do this, everyone will be working. If we do this, everyone will be fed. They want preachers to have answers like that. And let me tell you, I wish I did. But the truth is, is I'm not sure what the next thing is that God has in store for us. But I do know that God has answered. That God will hear our cries just as God has heard the cries of the Israelites. And God answers, I am here. Israel, you need water, and water you shall have. Israel's next right thing, the next thing that God needs them to do is not some radical thing that's up over the top. It's not some miraculous thing. It's not getting up all the courage they have and marching back to Pharaoh and say, give me a drink of water out of the Nile. No, God isn't asking them to do that next big thing. God's simply saying, keep going and trust. And sure enough, there was water. Sometimes the next right thing to do is simply to take the next step. To have our basic needs met. As much as we want to solve every problem of the world, as much as we have identified injustice everywhere and we want it fixed, sometimes God says... Take a deep breath and get a glass of water and rejuvenate yourself because there is work to do. But right now, you just need to get through today. That's a God who listens with compassion instead of an answer that gets us all scared inside. God says, here's some water. What you need right now is to care for yourself. Sometimes the next right thing is as simple as that. Israel wasn't out of the wilderness, 
but they were able to live another day. It did allow them to move a little bit farther to where God needed them to be. Israel wasn't in the promised land yet, but they were able to keep going. Just like you and I need to keep going one day at a time. So often, the next right thing for us to do in the face of injustice is to simply keep walking. Like Israel, when we are tired, when we are weary, when we are thirsty, when we are hungry, when we don't know what the next move ought to be, let's just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And maybe it's not a three-foot stride, Maybe it's just a little baby step, but let's keep moving. And so this morning, on Palm Sunday, we march, we walk. We walked waving our palm branches and singing Hosanna, even while the world our community, our congregations, our family, our own lives are not perfect. Everything isn't going exactly right, but yet we pressed on. We joined as a community and we pressed on. We made those cars on 8th Street stop as we walked across the street, as we waved our palms and singing, and they probably shook their heads and wanted to know what we had drank this morning. But it's okay, they said that about the apostles. Oh, they must be drunk. Maybe they thought that of us too. We don't always know what's next. But we move on. We keep walking. We lean into each other. We find hope and strength in one another. So on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus... I think kind of knew a little bit about what was going on. Jesus knew a little bit about what was lying ahead. Jesus perhaps even knows that his own death is now imminent. He knows that some of the people there waving those palm branches, setting their cloaks on the ground, proclaiming, Hosanna, are you blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He knows that they will turn away. He knows that those very same voices will demand his death. He knows. What's the next right thing for Jesus to do? Well, he could have gathered the disciples around and he could have said, or he could have started complaining and grumbling like the Israelites did so long ago. He could have said to the disciples and to the other people, will you just quiet down? Don't you know things are going to get bad for me? It's going to get really, really bad. I don't know if I can endure this. I don't know if I can do it. So all this shouting, you're simply making it worse. Won't you just be quiet and let us just sneak in the back door and do what has to be done? Can't we go in quietly? I don't want to be that person. But friends, if you haven't gotten it already, the party's over. Jesus could have done that. Jesus, in the face of adversity, could have given up. He could have cried out, God, what did you do? Why did you bring me to Jerusalem just so I could die? But instead, Jesus doesn't do that. He knows that on that walk of life, that walk even into Jerusalem, even in the face of his own death, he has to take the step. The next right thing for Jesus to do is to keep going. We cannot give in to the weariness of defeat, my friends. Even in the world tells us it doesn't make any sense, we need to keep going on. 
Perhaps that is the powerful message of Palm Sunday, is that we are called to be brave and foolish and risky enough to live boldly, even in the midst of the wilderness. We reframe these texts into the hard and holy work. In the face of brokenness and despair and injustice, maybe we need to be like those clowns on that day in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we just need to laugh and smile, and clap our hands, and wave our palm branches, and proclaim that we follow Jesus. Friends, life is hard. Life is really hard, and doing the holy work of God is even harder work. Life is not promised to be easy, but God says, I am here. I hear you. I listen to you. And I will give you what you need right now. It's not always the big answer. It's not always the solution. But it is the strength and the hope that we do the right thing. Every time I talk about the warming shelter, someone will ask me about what are we doing to end homelessness? Well, the reality is, is not a whole lot. That's a systemic issue. That's a big issue. Right now, I want to get people off the streets. Right now, I want to get food in their belly. Right now, I want to make sure they don't freeze to death. There's a lot of other big next things that God is calling people to do. But right now, maybe we should just be happy to say that we're providing a place of shelter and of hope. Maybe we're not eradicating hunger every Wednesday night, but we are for 200 people who eat those meals. Maybe you and I don't solve all of our problems when we come here on Sunday, but just maybe we can lean into one another and we get the encouragement and the hope and the wisdom to go another day, to move a little bit farther on God's journey of life. Because we are nourished by God, we can keep walking, we can keep marching for justice. The next right thing may not change the world, but our walking in solidarity wherever there is injustice is always the next thing to do. Dr. King once reminded us that not everybody can run. Some will just walk. And not everybody can walk, so some will just crawl. But whatever we do, we keep moving because God has given us the water from the most improbable places of the rocks and the desert God has provided. God says, keep going on. So friends, during this Holy Week, we are invited to be brave enough to trust in God even when it feels risky, even when the world tells us to quiet down. We are called to keep taking brave steps. That's what our palm branches are today. They are forever the reminder that in the midst of a dark, a harsh, a broken and unjust world, God is here and we walk with God. Amen. Friends, if you are able, I invite you to stand and let us sing together.
glorious things of thee are spoken. And I'll just add this editorial that this song itself becomes a protest song. If you were in Germany, this tune would be familiar to you. As part of your national anthem, the Nazi party would sing this song, or not this song, but this tune, as they proclaimed their loyalty to the powers and the pharaohs of this world. And in defiance, we sing the words of God's power in the world. Let us sing. special prayers today that you would like to lift up and have us pray for. So yes, Charlie. You're not that old. Okay. Okay, what's his first name? Richard. Richard, prayers for Richard from this reoccurrence of cancer and hope and strength for Charlie and all of his family and friends. I know Lucy DeWine called me early It's the second Sunday in three weeks where she just doesn't feel right and um, she was in tears that she couldn't be here on Palm Sunday. She thinks it may be the first Palm Sunday she's missed in a lifetime um, perhaps, but she asked for prayers and that they're able to find out something um, that's going on with her. Steve? Yes, for those who have been wrongly convicted in their time in prison unjustly, we pray. So, other prayers today? Yes, Lori. Prayers for Dina as she searches for answers 
to her cancer. Um, prayers for, um, I'm just choosing my words, so. Um, someone that we got to know through the shelter, um, his name is Ted. Um, prayers for Ted, he is up in Green Bay right now as he's um, dealing with some heart issues. So to lift him up. So, other things we wish to name today? What? Yes. Continued prayers for Elijah. It's hard to believe that that's been over a month now. Um, that, that, that that search continues. And thank you for uh, you and the community for all the work that, that people have, have done to help that search in, in big and small ways. So this week, um, through the shelter, we can celebrate that we've had um, one resident was able to find stable housing um, at the Haven. Um, two others that are in the midst of finding jobs this week, so we get to um, to celebrate that, uh, that those things are happening. So, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Holy and gracious God, sometimes we want you to always do the big, earth-shaking things, but sometimes you call us to simply walk to sit down in solidarity with siblings who cannot stand, to walk beside those who travel every day in search of basic needs. Continue, Lord, to help us see your presence even in small actions, that the next thing we are called to do doesn't have to be extraordinary. It just needs to be faithful. Lord, you have heard prayers that we have shared here, prayers of healing for those living with cancer, for those who aren't quite sure what their illness may be, for those with heart conditions. We pray. We pray for those that are known to us, and we pray for those that are only known to you. Send your presence to be among them and use us to share your grace. Lord, we continue to pray for Elijah and for the entire community that comes together. As always, as we have prayed from day one, we pray that he is wrapped in your arms, that wherever he is, he will not be afraid because you have held him close. Lord, we remember the countless injustices we see in the world, and we pray along with the prophets for so long ago that your justice will roll down like a mighty stream, that every knee will bow, every tongue confess. You are Lord of lords. King of kings, come, Lord Jesus, and find us humbled this week as we remember and reflect on the hard work that you did so that all the world may know life eternal. And now, O oh Lord, we invite you to be pleased with us as we pray our family prayer from our lips to your heart we pray our Father who art in heaven holy be your name your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning, you're invited to share an offering 
in some unique ways. You may have noticed when you come in at the rear of the sanctuary, there are a lot of these brilliant tulip plants that are sitting there. Those we want you to take and to deliver to some of our homebound members. There's cards there with their addresses in front of them. There are 14 of them. Some of them are, two or three of them are grouped together in um, um, care facilities where they live. But I encourage you to find one and take at least one to somebody after worship today as part of your offering. That may seem uncomfortable. It may seem like I don't know these people. But you know what? They don't know you either. But I can tell you that each one of them is hungering and thirsting and saying, what now, God? Now I can't even come to church. Now I can't even get out of the house. Now I can't do all these things. Let us take that step and bring a little bit of water to them to remind them that they are not alone. Of course, the offerings of our very lives God cherishes. And also the offerings, our financial offerings that allow us to continue to do the work of God in our midst are important. So as when Julie begins to play the music today, you're invited to come up to leave your financial offerings here to go and to look at some flowers to say, who's on my way home? Who lives near that I can take this to, deliver it to them on behalf of the church. If you have any extra opportunity today, you're welcome to share an extra offering this month. We share with, for the one great hour of sharing a national offering of both the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA and other denominations as well that supports disaster relief hunger relief, and investment in small businesses and individuals so they can have the joy of bringing themselves up in the sense that we teach them to fish and so they can fish for a lifetime. Friends, God has gifted us with many, many things. Let us come now and share our offerings with the Lord.
holy and gracious God, we thank you that you have gifted us with so many wonderful things. And now, O oh Lord, we ask that you will bless these gifts and bless us so that they and we will go forth and that we will help share water, that we will lean into one another and we will keep walking forward for justice as we follow you into this holy week. Amen. Let us, if you are able, stand and let us sing to the glory of God. Friends, let us remember that God has richly blessed us and that we are called to bless the world in the name of Christ. So let us, with one hand, have the sign of reception, receiving the blessings, and with the other, let us remind ourselves that we also go out as givers of God's blessing. And hear these words. May the God who heard your cries and the cries of the Israelites, make his face shine upon you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who chose to enter holy Jerusalem even when he knew it would mean suffering, may that grace, his grace, be with you. And may the Holy Spirit bind us together today and always as one people, striving walking, crawling, marching for justice in every place and every time. Let us go now in peace, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go out singing, We Shall Overcome.